In this episode, we are visiting the tropical paradise called Siquijor Island, located in the center of the Philippines. But as tempting as it is, we won't be just sitting on white sand beaches with cocktails in hand. The mission this week is to try and discover and document the underwater biodiversity around the island. We'll be exploring reef systems among the known dive sites around the island, and then also doing a lot of exploration dives to discover the unknown locations that Sikihor might have hidden offshore. Sikihor is well known for its pristine white sand beaches and its beautiful jungle waterfalls, not to mention its black magic origins. But what we are really here to find out is just how good of a dive destination Sikihor really is. Join me and the Critter Crew as we discover many shocking new marine species that we have never filmed before. Now let's go discover Sikihor from below. So we just arrived here at Sikihor with the whole crew and of course we're going to do tons and tons of diving and try to discover how much biodiversity is underwater around this amazing island. But before we do that, this is known as Black Magic Island. So we're going to get some checkups. We drove up here in the mountain, I mean mountain, it's the highest point for this island. And it's near San Antonio, Sikihor, and we finally found the Black Magic Witch Doctor or a faith healer, I guess they call it. Uh, but she wasn't home. We found the right house. Her niece got in our car and said, I'll go help you find her. I know where she's at. So we've been driving even farther up these mountain roads, as you can see behind me, and trying to get to where this witch doctor is, I guess. Anyway, we pretty much went as far as our car could go. So the niece and some of the crew walked down this road to go find the witch doctor and bring her back on a motorbike and then we're gonna get checked so the first thing i guess we're gonna do is the doctor is gonna check us all all the crew to make sure there's nothing wrong with us already and then they're gonna do some black magic uh voodoo i don't know and make sure no bad energies come our way during our time here at sikihor you know I don't want to get any jellyfish stings or shark bites. So you never know. Better to be careful. Either way, these are some amazing views up here in these crazy mountain roads. After quite a bit of driving through some beautiful countryside, we reached the interior of the island. And eventually, after lots of asking around, found the faith healer. One at a time, she sat the team down, lit some coals under our chairs, and blew smoke at us while whispering prayers. After checking us over for cuts and bruises, and finding a few jelly stings among us, she rubbed us down with her special brew of hot coconut oil mixed with a concoction of 200 different plant roots that she only collects on Fridays. She told us we had no secret ailments such as cancer or pregnancies, then gave us a blessing that would keep us free of any negative energies while here on the island. Only then were we safe to go and spend the rest of our trip underwater around Sikihor. We were now ready to dive. So we just arrived here in Sikihor and we're gonna get some awesome diving here at Apple Divers. Hey Kay! Hey, I'm Kay. Welcome to Sikihor. So Apple Divers is located right here in the center of San Juan, which is pretty much where everybody stays. It has the best weather year round and all the dive sites are on this side. But of course, we're gonna take the boat all around the island. Apple Divers has their own beach access, so the dive boat comes right up to the beach and we can load the gear. That's exactly what we're going to do now. We're going to do tons of diving this week just to find out what kind of biodiversity is under the waves just offshore.
Got to load up on the boat, but check this beach out. Super white sand, but somehow it's compact. It's not like, it doesn't sink when you walk, so it's easy. So nice. And then the pool. Just got to go load up the, uh, the boat now and get going. This is paradise right here. nothing better than white sand beaches warm water carrying your dive gear out to a boat uh oh I stepped in a hole look at those trees get done We are on the dive boat right now of Apple Divers and we are going out to our very first dive called West Point and then a second dive right next to it called Area 51. That's kind of a secret dive site that Kay, the owner of Apple Divers, discovered for himself. But this is going to be an awesome intro to Sikihor to see what kind of biodiversity is around this island because on one side is a lot of reef and wide angles and on the other side is like muck diving and the small critters and there's a big difference between muck diving and wide angle so what is the difference between wide angle landscapes and muck diving well since i am in sikihor discover all there is to offer for divers i'm doing a lot of both with wide angle which most divers prefer you find yourself gliding over large seascapes of healthy corals, and if you're lucky, schools of fish. It's great for the everyday diver who just wants to appreciate the beauty of the reefs and the reef fish. Buck diving is more favorable for photographers and videographers, and many divers will wonder why they have come there. It's usually consisting of large, barren landscapes, consisting of sand and rubble, or even broken bits of hard coral. Why would anyone want to muck dive? Well, actually, I prefer it. On a muck dive, when you pay attention to the small stuff and take a closer look, you are much more likely to discover some of the planet's most rare species, species that most humans will never encounter. Now let's go dive. Pretty much anywhere you dive in the Philippines, you're gonna find clownfish. The movie, Finding Nemo, introduced them to the world. But did you know there are actually many different species of clownfish? Nemo was this Ocellaris species. And after observing them for a while, I was able to get a good shot. All clownfish have one thing in common though. They all live in sea anemones, of which there are many different species as well. This one being a heteractus anemone. Now here's a fact that Finding Nemo never told us. All clownfish are born males. Once the dominant female dies, the male will transform itself into a female and take over the hierarchy. Nemo's dad was about to be transgender. There are about a thousand species of anemone in the world, but only around 10 of them are compatible with clownfish.
Clownfish aren't the only critter that enjoys the protection that anemones offer. This tiny and transparent glass shrimp takes a perch among the tentacles, swaying with the current and hoping they bring a tiny morsel close enough to grab a bite. He spends the entire day keeping those long arms and claws busy, alternating from food snagging duty to meticulously cleaning himself. The anemone also benefits as the shrimp will pick morsels off its tentacles and keep it clear of debris and parasites. Other types of shrimp also share this anemone, but are a tad bit more shy. You could guess why they are called popcorn shrimp, by their white bubbly faces, but they're also known as mushroom coral ghost shrimp. This is because they are mostly found in mushroom corals, which look very much like anemones, but are not. You won't find clownfish in mushroom corals. If you find one popcorn shrimp, be assured a second one is lurking somewhere watching you, as this species lives as couples in their symbiosis with the habitat. Now all shrimp share a love for hiding, but not all of them enjoy the protection of a stinging anemone. Some live exposed out in the open and rely heavily on their natural camouflage abilities. As Xenia shrimp find their Xenia homes, as tiny babies, they start to develop perfectly matching colors and patterns, making them completely invisible to predators. Unlike other shrimp, this tiny species lives only in one habitat, the Xenia soft coral. Despite eons of evolution trying to prevent me from being able to find these shrimp, I was lucky enough to find a couple of them, and even managed a nice photo. Nearby, in another pulsing zilia, I discovered two eyes peeking out from the soft coral tentacles. Although this crab can't boast the same magnificent camouflage as its shrimp neighbor, it definitely does a better job of hiding itself deep within the zilia. As I take a closer look, we see that not only does this tiny crab have an extremely comfortable house, but he also spends his days grabbing morsels from the water and from the zelia to eat. The zelia might also benefit here. I've heard these crabs also called protector crabs, and they've been witness to reach out and scare off potential predators of the zelia with those intimidating claws of theirs.
This smaller crab must have been banished to the smaller Xenia by its bigger neighbor. Whatever the case, he seems to be doing just fine here in his tiny pulsing palace. So we've already had some amazing diving here in Sikihor with Apple Divers. Uh, it's really exceeded our expectations. Me and the crew have run into some really rare crabs, shrimp, anemones everywhere with different species of clownfish. We've seen flatworms and everything else. But you know what? I just heard that there is an actual seashell museum right here in San Juan. So I want to go check it out. Apparently they have a huge collection of really rare species of shells, clams, all that kind of stuff that you can find in Philippines and a lot here in Sikihor. So after I have my coffee, we're going to head down there and check out the museum before our next dive. So let's do that. Just down the road in San Juan, we walked into an awesome little seashell museum that has thousands of species on display. From rare paper nautiluses to endangered tritons, there were so many cool specimens, many new to me. When you dive every day, you get to see a ton of strange snails out in the ocean. But in a museum like this, you get to see tons of species from all over the globe that you never knew existed. And the tour guide at the museum was quite knowledgeable as well. So this is an awesome little museum in uh, Sikihor. So many awesome species that I've never seen before. Some that I've only seen in books that I'd love to find in the ocean one day. But anyways, it is really hot. I'm gonna go try to find some of these in the ocean. So let's get geared up and go dive. Yeah, it's super hot today. So I had to jump in the pool, but I had all day to play around after the seashell museum because we're not diving in the day. We're going again tonight. Night diving here has been epic. So we're pretty much going to go every night. I'm done with the pool. It's time to get in the ocean. This bay here is really shallow. Give us a really long dive time, but so many critters just everywhere. It's an awesome dive. So let's go do it. This dive site turned into our go-to light diving location as there were more critters than our camera batteries could handle. They were just everywhere. Now we've all seen these in our videos from other parts of the Philippines, but it's hard to ignore one of the biggest and most beautiful sea slugs in the ocean. Our various dives around Dawan have brought us up close to a lot of flatworm species like this one. But on this trip to discover the species of Sikihor, I was delighted to find colors and variations and new species of flatworms that I'd never seen. Observing these beauties in the night torches is always a treat. Polyclad flatworms are found all over the globe, with around 1,000 different species of them slithering around the ocean floors. Divers can always be sure to find interesting varieties on any dive. I followed this one around for a while, watching an interest as it crawls all over the ground and wondering what he's looking for. For me, it's just enough to observe their elegant movements.
orange spiral mass that the flatworm is crawling over is a string of eggs, but ironically, they are nudibranch eggs and not flatworm. This just reinforces how good this dive site really is. Many flatworms are brightly colored, advertising their toxic nature and telling predators they are not very yummy to eat. And since they have no predators lurking around every corner, they have no problem taking a stroll along the reefs. In fact, sometimes they stop crawling and prefer to swim. It must take a lot of energy for a flatworm to swim in this fashion. They can only go in short bursts, for the most part. However, if they want to go far distances, all they have to do is catch the next current and glide to the next destination. Luckily for me, this guy preferred to give me a show. Although flatworms have primitive bodies, they actually have some pretty cool abilities. For instance, some of them are capable of mimicking toxic nudibranch. They also have another cool trait where they can lose part of their body and that piece will grow into a whole new individual. It's a wonder that we found this flatworm, as it is so tiny. These are not white boulders there next to them. Those are tiny grains of sand, giving you an idea just how small this one really is. To show you just how small he is, I set my finger in the sand and he crawled right over it. Now this is still zoomed in, but if you look at your own index fingernail, you'll realize that he is about one fifth that size, and you'll get some idea. Like I said, it's a miracle we found him at all. There are a lot of species of Flabellina nudibranch out there, and it's fascinating what ones you'll see depending on the region. This particular Flabellina is an undescribed and unnamed species, and one that I have yet to see in the Philippines. And believe me, I've tried. I even published a book on Amazon about nudibranch of Darwin, where my dive buddy and I found over 300 species. Yet, as soon as I arrive at Sikihor, we find more. Although this pair of nudies were actually not that small, maybe 2 centimeters long, they were living on this delicate, stinging hydroid. Normally, when we check hydroids, we find much, much smaller nudies, such as the Eubrancus genus, but these guys were a welcome change tonight. Another amazing nudibranch species that I never knew existed is this Cabangus rheus, and it's one of the most colorful that I've seen in a long time. What an awesome find. He's definitely new to me and certainly never made it into my book. There are 
thousands of species of ladybrake in the world and at least 1500 known in the Philippines. Each one of them sporting their own patterns and body styles and colors, making for a favorite for many divers. What makes them a favorite for underwater photographers, however, is that they aren't scared of us and do not shy away from the camera, making for the perfect photo and video subjects. When we get tired of wishing those cardinal fish or clownfish would hold still for the shot, all we have to do is look around and we'll be sure to find the most cooperative little subjects ready for their close-ups. As a kid, did you ever play with a BB gun? Well, this incredible slug was about half the size of one of those tiny BBs. Just imagine that. Whenever my guide calls me over to tell me he's found something, I'm always excited, wondering what I'm about to see next. And each time he shows me an amazing critter this tiny, living in its own universe, hidden from the rest of the world, it reminds me that sometimes we have to take a closer look at our world to discover more. There's always more on a dive, always something different. Each time we drop beneath the waves and turn on the lights, we find things that have stretched the imagination since we were kids. We make it our mission to show tiny creatures like this to the whole world and show them what is out there or yet to be discovered. Right, but we finally arrived here in Lazzy Bay and we're at the uh, commercial pier which we're gonna dive under. It's massive. It's kind of uh, out of commission right now I guess. Nobody's here. Diving underneath, see what it looks like from below. The Lazy Pier is one of the biggest that I've dove under, and it had a lot of different landscapes going on underneath. Of course, there's the iconic sunbeam views when you look up at the pillars. And on the ground, there's a mix of sand, rubble, and hard corals, all hiding critters.
But of course, we weren't gonna miss anything. So the pillars themselves had to be searched. And on their sides, we found countless little wonders. Among the rubble, a mixture of rocks and steel thrown from above, I found this giant moray peeking out from his cave. Hawkfish made an appearance, but little did I know until researching later that there's actually many different species of hawkfish, and this one is an even more colorful variation. One of those pillars that we searched had this Limbrotha species of nudibranch, but when I looked around the area, there were tons of them everywhere. This one wandered around in the sands, presumably looking for something tasty to eat, or perhaps even a fellow Limbrotha to mate with. It's a good chance this little dude was looking for a mate because we found many different couples under the pier doing their seductive tango. If I haven't mentioned it yet, all nudibranch are hermaphrodites, both with male and female parts. When they come together, their four sexual organs, two of each, come together and simultaneously impregnate and get impregnated by one another. Even full of eggs and sperm, they cannot fertilize themselves though, just in case you were wondering. Of course, I took a nice little wedding photo of the lovely couple. Not far off, there was another looty break that must be a little further along in its term, as I got to watch it lay its eggs on the side of a pillar. A yellow ribbon of thousands of eggs full of new little critters. I've shown a lot of flatworms in this episode, and believe me, we saw way more than we could show. But certain ones you just can't ignore. Even though I covered many marine flatworm species in my book, and even though I've seen dozens and dozens of varieties around the world, I'm still in awe when I can find a new one that I have not seen before. One with awesome patterns like this one. I never get tired of watching them. Believe it or not, this is a nudie break as well, really showing how many amazing varieties and shapes and sizes that they come in. 
This one was so tiny, it's almost invisible to see, as it cleaves to the side of a stinging hydroid. What I didn't know while filming this was that the little guy was laying a string of eggs. After looking at the footage now, we can clearly see the eggs here, with more working their way out of its body. What an amazing find. I was in shock when I saw this later. It's always an incredible wonder when you get to see how the world works at such a microscopic level. Sea snakes are a common sighting all over the country, and if they aren't swimming along the reef looking for a meal, they can be seen swimming towards the surface to get a gulp of air. Now, we were on our way to the other side of the island for our next dive, but Sikihor has too much to offer on land, and we quickly got distracted and had to make a few stops. We checked out the 400 year old enchanted belated tree. We got some voodoo souvenirs. We explored the beautiful Kabagayan waterfalls, and we even got invited to a traditional lechon barbecue. Let's eat. With such a busy schedule with us spending most of our waking hours underwater, we were sure glad we got to witness some of Sikihor's amazing topside beauty along the way. As fun as it was though, seeing the sights, that night we were straight back into the water for our last dive of the trip. So enough of this on land nonsense. It's almost night time. We're gonna go do our night dive and my new favorite night dive site in Sikihor, Sabang Bay. So many critters here. We love it. We gotta come every night. <laughs> Ah, the Circe Elegance. Believe it or not, this walking rose is actually a nudie break, and one that is on top of many scuba divers' bucket lists. And I'm sure you can see why. This is not a tiny macro critter, being about the size of a golf ball. And besides those long rhinophores up front, his transparent flower petal-like body makes for one of the most unique if not delicate, critters on the entire planet. What an awesome start to the night. Not far off, I ran into my very first ever bubble snail. Now these are a weird relative to the nitty brain, but as you can see, they have yet to evolve out of their shell like their cousins. These mollusks can be found in a huge variety of colors and patterns, and I've been hoping for a long time to finally get to film one. And tonight, it happened. And of course, I'm not going to just film it, since it's my first time seeing one. I also need to get a photo or two. What is that? I had no idea what I was filming. I just knew that it kind of looked like another bubble snail, although not quite. This one seems to be even earlier in evolution, as it seems his shell is still inside its body. Now this is a proper nitty break. However, this little dude was only about 2 meters deep in the water, and the surge made it hard to get a steady shot. 
Luckily for him, he was clinging on pretty hard to the ground. It feels like this trip has countless marine flatworms for us to find. In fact, I can't fit in half of the ones we've seen in this episode, but some are just too beautiful to pass up. Did you know, unlike Duty Brank, flatworms usually have eyes? Right here up front, they have what is called an eye spot. In that eye spot, they have a big cluster of multiple tiny eyes, all in the same spot. Now this nudie brink I've seen many times around the Philippines. They always stand out with those neon green rhinophores. But what I'm reminded of most is that they are many times mimicked by common sea slugs. These sea slugs evolve to look just like a toxic nudie brink, falsely telling the predators to stay away. It's genius. Sometimes you just have to turn on the camera, turn on the lights, take aim, and just follow along and see what the critter is doing that night. I'm always happy to discover the daily going-ons of tiny creatures of the night. Now this is one crazy blitty. Now normally I don't have a lot of luck when it comes to filming extremely shy gobies and blennies. They don't appreciate the paparazzi and always dart away when approached. But this giant blenny that I have never seen before was quite the opposite. All this guy wanted was his 15 minutes of fame and he sat right there giving me multiple poses. It was great. My wife was a little jealous of his magnificent eyelashes, however. Now let's talk about the octopus of this crazy dive site. Everywhere we went, there was another tiny octopus staring at us from under a rock or something. The problem was, half of them we still can't identify. Although we saw sometimes six per dive in this really small dive area, they were all about the size of golf balls, constantly changing colors, and impossible for us to name. It could be a white V octopus, possibly. We just don't know. But what is universally known is that they are always fun to observe.
Sometimes, though, we did run into one that we could identify, like the long arm octopus. Believe it or not, I've never actually seen one before coming to Psychihor, and now I've filmed many. What really stuck out to me about these guys is how thick and round their arms are. Even the octopus is pretty small. Their arms made them look like tiny bodybuilders. Maybe they should rename these to He-Man octopuses. Let's end this dive right by showing you the cutest cephalopod in the seas, the bobtail squid. No matter who you are or where you are, if you try to film a bobtail, he's guaranteed to drop down and try to bury himself in the sand, thinking he's a good hider. Of course, sometimes you need help getting the sand all the way on top. This bobtail must have just come out of the sand because you can see the grain still sticking to his body. We really ended our trip on a high note with this night dive. We dove and filmed until every camera battery was dead and even our lights and torches extinguished. What an amazing island. As we come to the end of our trip and finally have a minute to reflect, I'm certain that Sikihor delivered beyond expectations. In the scuba and marine biology forums, no one had ever mentioned the island of Sikihor as a must-visit location, so we really had low expectations of how we thought the reef and marine life would be. Needless to say, with just 10 days and countless rare underwater critters we found here, with just a little underwater exploration, our expectations were completely blown out of the water. So now the secret is out and we have found that Sikihor is indeed worthy of being mentioned with the other great dive destinations of the Philippines. So we've taken the boat and we are back here in Dawin editing the documentary and I think we just missed all the rains in Sikihor. But our minds are still blown about how many different species we were able to film and one week in Sikihor. We had uh, doubts whether we would be able to get enough footage for an entire hour long documentary, uh, but it turns out we got way more. We could have made three documentaries. Um, I wasn't able to show half the critters that we saw, so we're gonna be slowly editing those little sections and showing individual little creatures on the YouTube channel. So make sure to subscribe. Um, and a big shout out to my crew, of course, Alex, he's there for everything. Uh, Gitan, helping me film such amazing species. And my lovely wife, who, you know, always there for everything. <laughs> and, uh, and then a huge shout out to Kay and Kim at Apple Divers for hosting us, showing us Siki Horror, taking us on countless dives, showing us all the different sites. It was really an amazing trip, so. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure to subscribe because we're now working on another documentary about marine biology and marine ecosystem here in Dowin. And I'll see you there on the next one. Bye.